Hello. Hello and welcome to this evening's session of Beers and Bites, hosted by Chris Jordan of Fluency and Jeremy Murdershaw of Fortify 24-7. Our special guest this evening, now you understand it's a German last name, so it is Corey Nachreiner, right? You didn't put enough phlegm in that. It needs a little more phlegm, Al. I'm offended. So... So with that, Corey is the CTO of WatchGuard Technologies and has been there for some 20 plus years. I think it might be somewhere between 22 to 25 years. Your your Uh, 22 is correct. 22, all right. So with that, then uh, let's go ahead and show our beers this evening. Chris, why don't you lead us off? Which beer do you bring? So one, I snuck back from Florida. It's the Unholy. Um, You gotta love these. Unholy. (laughs) <laughs> and uh you know it, it's it's interesting because they're just out of uh the copper trail they're kind of copper trail they're kind of just out of tampa bay and so i could have gone with the what's that other one down there cigar or something but i, I didn't uh somebody else preferred this and i said great so I, I picked some of it up um it's my last one and then uh like always Corey, we don't we don't like to go back to the fridge so we just we always bring two with us um I'm finishing off the last of my Virginia beer on this one. It's funny, it's the Liquid Escape. I was just down uh, this weekend at Virginia Tech at the Brewdo, which is a beer festival. And uh, coincidence, I would go down for a beer festival. And uh, this happened to be the beer that they were uh, distributing. So either they're just trying to get rid of the rest of it or they're, they're, they're proud of it. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to start with the Unholy, though. And, and if, if the Corey... We'll, we'll get the hard alcohol if these two don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, what did you bring this evening? All right, I got a, uh, a triple IP, a triple hazy IPA uh, from a, a California uh, brewery called Local Craft Beer. The beer is called uh, Cheers, Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> It's a nice 10 percenter, so that'll get me right in the mood to ask the right questions here. And then uh, for my second beer, I got a little more of a fruity guy uh, from Firestone, also a California beer um, called the Laponic Distortion. Where's the camera? There we go. There you go. <laughs> it's got uh, hints of peach and dragon fruit. It's only 5.9, so be a nice dessert after my uh my triple hazy all right so Corey, what did you bring this evening sir he's already, he's already hitting it yeah i'm I, i'm already into it i cracked it before <laughs> but i'll show you the can it's pretty boring i mean it's a great beer but a guinness stout uh drought and uh it's kind of embarrassing even why i have it in my house it's not for some cool beer connoisseur reason uh, I was doing miracle berries with friends to do like a, what do they call it? Food tripping or taste tripping. Don't know if you heard of them. They take sour things and make it taste sweet after you eat this berry. And uh, someone said you should try a Guinness with it. So I had a few on hand. Excellent. And this <laughs> evening, and thankfully my wife went shopping for me this time. So no more Alaskan beer, uh, but I'm bringing a Sierra Nevada hazy little thing ipa that is uh, about 6.7 percent and it's in a tall boy pint can so i don't have to go back to the fridge for number two because number two is already built in normal size all right so with that corey uh if you wouldn't mind tell us a little bit about uh yourself what you do and your history at uh what's good so you've got quite a background, and I'm sure we'll get into that here in just a few moments. Yeah, like you said, uh, I've been at one company for 22 years, which is kind of crazy in this industry. You know, most people are moving every four, uh, but I've had just about every job you could have at WatchGuard Technologies. So right now, I am CTO. By the way, was a good, uh, a good, you know description for me because that was my title three months ago but now i'm officially the cso too so in the cto role which by the way you get a new title you don't lose any of your other jobs so i still do all the old stuff the the cto role uh, i was primarily uh, you know i ran our watch guard threat lab team a team of researchers that kind of keep our thumb on the the pulse of the underground to see what bad guys are doing uh we do a lot of speaking we do a lot of research we found and disclosed vulnerabilities and products uh and we do that kind of thing from an executive level on the CTO role. 
you know, I've been in product at WatchGuard too, but in the CTO role, I was kind of the head of M&A among a small executive Tiger team. So of course, product management and our SVP of engineering would take care of organic development of products we have. I would look at the threats and find new technologies we need to help our customers and go acquire those companies. And over the past five years, we've grown quite a bit through acquisition. But now I've also been added the CSO role. So I do literally, it used to be kind of uh, a few people uh, that were associated in the IT team, but I do now head up our SOC and, and, and manage the security of our organization itself, which is getting quite large in, in global. So now I'm not just the ivory tower of telling you what is in, I actually have to follow my advice, which sometimes it's a lot harder to get done the simple stuff you, you know you should be doing. So uh, yeah, and in my history, I've been everything from a malware and security analyst in my young days to the director of security strategy and research at the company. I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'd never call myself a hacker, but I, I grew up on BBSs and, and, and kind of did gray hat exploration like everyone else. So uh, kind of a, a wide variety of knowledge in security space. Excellent. So I also understand that you're an international speaker and quite often are called to a lot of these big events and stuff with fairly big names. So my curiosity is what what types of subjects, what are the top three subjects that that you're often asked to speak about? Yeah, well, the first one I remember, uh, you know, it was probably back in 2011. It was I went to Paranoia in Oslo. And at the time we were doing research, you don't hear a lot about botnets nowadays because they're pretty normal. But uh, back in those days, you know, IRC bots like ZBot were still big. So we had done some research into bots. Uh, so it was kind of a detailed tech dive into bots down to, you know, the leaked source code. We did source code analysis, talked about how modular and how kind of organized some of the prod projects were for this source code. So that was kind of the more technical talk. I, I have to admit now they get more high level because I'm talking more to the management and business level. So we talk a lot about threat trends. What are the top sh threat trends of the year? Uh, lately, I've been talking about big game ransomware and supply chain attacks. And of course, the defenses around it. So many, many different topics. Uh, still haven't spoke at DEF CON yet. Uh, that, that would be a spot even for really smart uh, security folks. Uh, definitely have to go very technical there. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So now I understand that uh, over the years that you've come forward to making predictions. Absolutely. To what's going to be coming. And I'm curious, as you see to the end of 2021 and maybe first half of 22, what are the top three predictions that you would have for security teams to really pay attention to? Well, if you give me two seconds, I'll bring up just to remind myself, we did release <laughs> predictions already for this year. Uh, in fact, I even have the meeting to start to talk about these for next year. And by the way, we do fun things where we, we don't just do the predictions, but at the end of the year, we grade ourselves. We've had uh -huh. years where we've hit 75%, but I have to admit last year was maybe 50%. Uh, last year, we also did a Hot Ones version of our predictions recap where we had to eat a hot wing for every prediction we got wrong. Oh. But but, <laughs> but some of the predictions we talked about this year is one uh, was automation driving a tidal wave of spear phishing campaigns. Uh, I think we all know what phishing and spear phishing is. Uh, obviously, spear phishing is much more dangerous when these threat actors learn enough about you or your organization or certain departments of your organization to write really customized and personalized emails, your users click on them more. But one of the things that have saved us from spear phishing is that kind of customization and personalization tends to take manual work by these threat actors, right? They have to get, there's lots of easy ways to do it, going to social media, learning about your company, but they had to do something and they couldn't quite automate that before the way they just automate generic spam to send out to millions of people. But, you know, we all have OSNIT tools, open source intelligent tools, some that like track social networks that track, oh, I found this you know, I know Corey's work address, what other email addresses are associated to him. If I go to social networks, who does he talk to? Who are people he knows? There are now tools that kind of 
uh, automate some of that that human intelligence that you can get from the internet. And I think uh, the prediction was really around threat actors are starting to, you know, take that that reconnaissance they would do to write spear phishing emails and connect that automated social network mapping stuff to their already existing automatic spam stuff, which really just translates to the fact that they could more effectively send lots of spear phishing emails at once and kind of turn it into a spam thing rather than manual uh, attack thing. So that was one thing we talked about. Uh, I'll give you one of our softball or our, our, our give me predictions, which is obvious because it happened before, uh, but we did do this right pre-pandemic. These predictions came out, uh, I believe at the end of 2019, uh, but we mentioned that that attackers would swarm VPNs and RTPs as remote workforce swells. So uh, yeah, I think everyone knows that RDPs that are public have been under attack for a long time. But VPNs in particular, we thought would be targeted. And, uh, you know, I don't want to throw... Uh, dirt at other companies, but there's a couple of VPN vendors and even competitors of ours that have had VPN vulnerabilities that resulted in, you know, attackers using those to mass grab tons and tons of VPN credentials and, and use those, of course, in attack. So that was another prediction we had, which, you know, is an obvious give me in this day and age of remote uh, people. Uh, one of our bold predictions is any publicly available authentication service that didn't have MFA would suffer a breach. Uh, to, to be honest, we kind of want to put that hand in hand with VPN and RDP because, one, we don't think RDP should ever be exposed on the internet. You should have a VPN in front of it. And two, if you have VPN, it better have MFA. You shouldn't be using VPN without it. So those are a couple of the predictions. There's certainly more if you want to go into some of them. Oh, well, listen, I think it's, it's time I probably turn over to Chris and Jeremy for some questions here. Guys, come on. You can start, Jeremy. All right, I'll jump in it. <laughs> so WatchGuard, what is the, uh, who is your target demographic? Uh, who is your target yeah. customer? What is the, what does that ideal customer look like? So for us, <laughs> you meant watch guards, not like, uh, I, I shouldn't say this. I'll get canceled right away if I say my target demographic. Uh, no, so watch guard definitely is looking uh, at, at smaller companies. We're not going after the big enterprises or the big banks. We started 100% focusing on the SMB. Uh, now, uh, our market is really the idea of bringing enterprise-grade security to the mid-market. The only reason we change from SMB is we do have some bigger companies that are distributed enterprises. You know, they might not have a headquarters of 10,000 people, but they have a headquarters of 2,000 to 5,000 people. And then they have literally hundreds of locations that might be 10 or, or 50 people, kind of that franchisee model. But what we're trying to do, how we differentiate is, you know, no matter how much the industry tries to simplify security, it can be complex. And these small businesses, they don't have security professionals half the time. It's the IT guy that's doing it. So we're trying to provide really good security controls to someone that may not be a person that runs a SOC or has, has an instant response team and stuff like that. So mid-market and SMB are our customers. And by the way, we do sell 100% through the channel. Like It's not something you can buy at a store. So I would say internally, one of our biggest customers is a managed service provider or a managed security service provider. And that that's kind of a change in the last 10 years or so because SMBs no longer are doing their own IT or security, right? They're just running their business and outsourcing that. So now in order to deliver good security to a small business, you have to have functionality that makes it easy for those service providers to automate a lot of what they do. So why WatchGuard and not SonicWall or Fortinet or maybe like an entry-level checkpoint box? <laughs> Uh, so there's a ton. It depends. Do you want to go geeky or do you want to go high end? I, I would say our differentiation right now is really about a unified security platform. So the one thing I'll say is we, we're known for firewalls. By the way, I hate that people still say firewalls because our network security appliances do so much more than firewall. And it's the network security service that matters. The firewall is just table stakes. But as I mentioned, over the five years, we've been really focused on growing our portfolio to M&A through M&A. And notice I said, uh, not that we deliver network security to mid-sized enterprises, but 
security. Uh, so right now, we just recently acquired an endpoint company, Panda Security from Spain. I'm not sure if you heard of them. Full EPP, EDR suite, uh, patch management, all the security controls you'd need on an endpoint. We acquired a, a multi-factor authentication company used by big banks in Brazil and turned that into a cloud multi-factor authentication solution uh, similar to folks like Duo. Uh, and we also acquired things like a, a, a strong arm from percipient which was a dns firewall you know if you know cisco umbrella which used to be open dns similar so what we're going for you know there's lots of ways that my next generation firewall can be better than sonic wall but what we're really trying to do is simplify and bring things under a single pane of glass so we've taken network endpoint and identity really the three pillars of security and brought them together because we believe one for smbs you need to kind of make it easier to manage that by putting it all together and two we strongly believe you know i hate analyst acronyms uh, don't tell Gartner that I don't want them to move me down in my, my magic quadrant because I said that. But XDR, that extended detection response, I truly believe we all know that, that endpoint controls can catch some stuff. We also know that they can miss some stuff. Same with network controls, right? IPS is great at catching known attacks, but depending on how good your IPS is, you know, something like segmenting traffic can sometimes evade a bad IPS. Endpoint, endpoint, you know, when the attack hits the endpoint, there's a lot of indicators the endpoint has and can look at that the network will never see. But you know, if you have a kernel level rootkit you can install, suddenly your endpoint doesn't even know what's really happening because it's being hidden. And my point is neither one of these controls can find everything on their own. But when you start to correlate the indicators, you know, that rootkit that might be hiding a file on a computer from the OS in a security program, if it still needs to reach out to a command and control channel, there's a chance that the, the network will see it, for instance. So as you can tell, we're taking all these security in network endpoint and, and identity and bringing them together, one, to make it easy and simpler for SMBs and mid-market to manage, but two, I think we're going to be able to find more sophisticated threats that you couldn't find by one of those alone by kind of correlating that, which is something our data scientists are doing right now with, with all the indicators we have from those three types of controls. No more Hope that made it. And by the way, SonicWall just sucks. I mean, look at NSS's <laughs> test. Uh, I, I, uh, NSS Labs now out of business. <laughs> Yeah, out of business. <laughs> but 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 I am a nerd, and I don't know how deep you want to go into IPS. But not every security control is created equal. One of the things I liked about NSS Labs is they tested your IPS against real exploits, and then they did evasions. There's a whole list of different evasions you could do. So if you want to know why we're better than some of the folks you see, look at that test. We were in the we were in the top right corner, which means we caught a lot of stuff but you'll notice some people have a very long line you have they have a dot in one place and a very long line that goes down and moves it to another place that was because their ips yes it caught that attack but if you did this evasion it missed it we did not miss any evasions we were one of two companies that didn't miss the evasions so when it comes down to it we're kind of security geeks and and we do our best we pay attention to the threat underground we pay attention when, to when hackers figure out new ways to bypass the security control and we do our darndest to keep up so we're that one test for instance kind of to me empirically and in, in, in it shows our efficiency or our efficacy compared to others i like the fact that you have enough cojones to to say i <laughs> screw sonic wall just straight out that's great but, uh, to, to be honest, there, there's a lot like Fortinet, they, they all have good things. They're all doing some sure. decent stuff, but uh, we do have well. some magic sect. Uh, yeah, they're kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you bring up an interesting point, Corey. So as, as we look at the industry right now as a community, and you brought up DEF CON, which is used to be one of my favorite communities until they decided to cancel themselves. The... Uh, <laughs> So, so the big question really is, is so NSS, they're, they're, they're gone. Let's just, yeah, they are. And, and from a testing perspective, there's nobody there anymore, right? There, there's, yeah, yeah. There, there's one we're working with, though. So, so, so who is it? 
I always get, I, I need to Google it because I always mix it. It's either open NetSec or NetSec open. <laughs> so right now there's kind of an open source group. It's NetSec open, by the way. Uh, so obviously they leave. Uh, the thing I liked about NSS, even though I'm there have been drama around NSS too, by the way, and you certainly have to pay to get some of their information uh, to, to learn how you're going to do on tests before they happen. But uh, it, I, I do think for the technical folks out there, you want a real efficacy test. Analysts, they tell you what customers tell you about the product. They tell you what they think about the roadmap that's being presented to them. But let's be honest, they don't know they don't know a network evasion if it bit them on the butt, and, and they're not testing the system or in the UI themselves a lot. Uh, NSS did tests, but NetSec Open is kind of this open source community but that, by the way, the vendors are participating in. We're participating. Some of the competitors you listed are participating, and, and then the rest of the community is participating where we're openly designing both performance and security standards. Here's how we're gonna test performance. Here are the traffic, like this won't be a BS test where we just send the same size packet over and over. Here are the traffic mixes. And here's as a community, you know, if I'm in, a, in one of these meetings with one of my competitors, we have to agree this is how much streaming video is going to be represented. And, and by this open source community effort, you get traffic mixes that are real world. And, and then they actually get the third party to use testing equipment to, to see how you do. So I think that is kind of trying to take the place of this. It's still kind of new. Uh, they started more on the performance side than the security side, but they're adding malware and IPS testing. That's part of the weekly meetings that people on my engineering team go to. So I think NetSec Open is where you can go to look for the, the more realistic efficacy tests for both security and how they will, will really perform. You know, let, let our, our data sheets, we, we never are inaccurate, but everyone always picks the packet size that does best. So it, it's nice to see a real mix of traffic being sent through devices when you're testing it. So you bring up an interesting thing about the knowledge base, right? So one of the things that even for our company struggles is, is collecting knowledge, right? So ever since there's been more of a paid to play on the exploit writing, right? The selling of exploits. Yeah, but then- uh, I mean, that's the really big, big switch, right? So the early 2000s, you saw the movement away from DEF CON as being a, a platform to talk about the latest exploits to people just selling their wares because the people that could talk about exploits were selling them. They were making money doing, doing you know, selling exploits. Yeah, so, a so million the, if you have the right one. <laughs> yeah, so they were really, regardless of how open source it is, I mean, we're looking at like the Sigma signatures, right? As, as one of the rare sources out there, but yet still the quality that is in the community base still isn't that strong because of the pay to play. And so what are you doing right now at WatchGuard to get an edge in the information you collect other than open source? Oh, and by the way, NetSec Open is not about getting threat intelligence, by the way. We don't get any threat right, intelligence from it, that. Right? Yeah, It's more about testing. Yeah, so they, they do use signature sets, but when they're testing, it's always known stuff. It's less about a zero day. Uh, so let's say malware. I mean, we acquired Panda Security. We have our own team. Uh, they have tens of millions of endpoints around the world. And nowadays that endpoint protection is, and EDR isn't just signatures. The way we get threat intelligence is we get new files submitted to our cloud all day long, every day. Uh, we have data scientists that have many different machine learning out, uh, models that take you know, previous known malware no, that have previous known exploits, but they're not really looking for a signature of that exploit. They've looked at Billion, millions of samples of malware and the you know unsupervised learning has figured out a feature that stands out that maybe a human wouldn't figure out but that this could could be suspicious and then that goes to one of our human researchers to look at so a lot of our threat intelligence is gathered ourselves especially from the endpoint level uh, for some of the other stuff though you know for things like IPS that we think is relatively commoditized we outsource that so we we work with trend micro they acquired a 
company called Broadweb, and they're the ones that create our IPS signatures. Now, granted, a lot of IPS signatures are built on vulnerabilities that are known. I think what you're talking about when it's a bug bounty is the fear is some new vulnerability that hasn't come out yet. But even with bug bounties, you know, by definition, a bug bounty uh, when it's being reported like that, it's not something that's being exploited in the wild. And by the time it's the whole point of the bug bounty is to disclose to the vendor. And we do, we do participate. I, they changed the name of it, but Microsoft had the map service. So for instance, if, if you were a security vendor, uh, Microsoft, they get reported new vulnerabilities all the time that they patch during you know Patch Tuesday. But if you're part of MAP, you get a early warning about that vulnerability and because you're shared the researcher details before the actual patch Tuesday so that we can write signatures for that vulnerability window before the patch comes out. So uh, long story short, some of our, our, our research is organic internally from our researchers, from our network and endpoint devices gathering all this intelligence. Some we buy through many commercial vendors, not open source. And then we participate in all the programs programs that give us early announcements so that we can kind of write protections uh, before some vendors release patches. So do you think, you know, you, you went down the file conversation and that's probably the most mature aspect of security today, right? But Absolutely. We all, but we all realize, especially during the pandemic, that there's significant reliance on the cloud and on processes, right? You brought up purchasing an identity, which to tell you the truth, most companies really didn't comprehend the concept of identity as being a pillar, right? So, you know, my point to you is, is that where do you see uh, WatchGuard moving to be able to address these other areas? Because to tell you the truth, I hate to say commodity, but, but looking at a file is a commodity today, right? Reputation defense, right? Open DNS and MD5 checks or SHA-256 checks are such a commodity that the attackers have already begun to move on, right? Nobody, if, if, if you're going to a website that says, hey, this is dangerous when your browser says that, you know what? I don't even think the attacker even cares anymore at this point here. They've moved on to something else. So, so the question really is, is, is WatchGuard looks at this industry and you look at protecting the SMB, which to tell you the truth, the SMB is different than all the big, if you, they, they tell you, right? 50% of the security budget is in the top 100 companies. Yeah, but to, how, a lot of the attacks start below, right, though. <laughs> right, and so so really, the my, where I'm getting to this question to you is 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 you are SMB's security group. They don't have Absolutely. It themselves. Yeah. And, and 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 as the attacks have begun to move to other places, what what are you what are you seeing? And and you can tell me ahead of time if you want to. I'll stop recording. You can tell me who you're going to acquire. Um, I know. Where do you think this is going? <laughs> Can't say that. Okay. So where do you think this is going as far as uh, the industry goes, as far as where do you think the real next line is? Because it's definitely not virals. It's definitely not EDR and XDR. Anything that Gartner even knows, even on the hype curve, is already dead, right? So so what is it that you see as the, as the next frontier? As I see, you have Star Trek. Uh, Star I, I'm not I think of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's the, the case because I, I don't think a lot of security companies do half the stuff Gartner says well yet. Like, um, again, I, I don't love these acronyms, but SASE, Secure Access, Secure Edge, is the, the, the idea of this is a company is no longer just an office. There, there's, there are still perimeters but they're all over the place and they're kind of, of, of chewy. So, you know, it used to be all our security was around our main office data center and you had all these little branch perimeters that were connected, but now all of us have stuff in the cloud. And the cloud, by the way, is not, it's just an easy way for us to describe something, but there's, there's, you know, uh, virtual data centers that are customer managed themselves, their own cloud, private cloud. There's, uh, you know, infrastructure as a service or, or platform as a service, AWS in, in Azure, where we all have stuff in there. Then there's SaaS. SaaS is the cloud too. But really, that's the application I have no control of. I just put my data somewhere else. I All my emails sitting in Microsoft's cloud with, with very little control. So how you secure this new topology is something we're all doing bits of, but I don't think the full unified solution has come out. 
which is how do I make one security policy that, you know, and by the way, the pandemic, the other aspect of that is remote users. Remote employees were growing well before the pandemic, but now they're just a a fact. Even when the the pandemic's done, knowledge-based work is going to be 50% remote at least going forward. So, How do I have the same policy when some people aren't behind my network perimeter where I have network security? You know, some of my stuff is in this cloud that I can throw network. I I can now spin up my boxes in Azure in a private cloud, but I can't spin it up in SaaS. How do I protect SaaS? And then that brings another crazy acronym, CASB. And the truth is all these different acronyms are separate. How can I just have one policy I apply everywhere? And that is kind of this idea of SASE. That is the acronym Gartner made, but I don't think there's any product that really covers all aspects of that yet. So I I, I know you're saying if they're talking about it, they're behind the game, Uh, but I actually, I, I don't think anyone has brought all those products together well. And that's what we're driving to. Uh, we're driving to, with these three pillars, one, we want to make sure, you know, our acquisition of Endpoint was because we realized this remote work. There's stuff we have to do at the Endpoint. We've been network only. We're missing a big point part of it. Uh, luckily, our network controls can work well in cloud. But how do we have this single place where everyone goes to get policy. And I think that's what we're working on now. That is part of our SASE strategy, where we want to have this hosted cloud central place where, you know, if your remote user wants to get network services, suddenly they don't need our, our firewall. They just connect through the same agent that gives them endpoint security. And we, we, we redirect them through tunneling and they get cloud security with the same policy as the corporate on-premise firewall when they go to the cloud. And, and same for all your cloud workloads. By the way, I also don't think attackers are that far ahead of the curve. I My feeling is, it, it sounds like you guys go to Black Hat and DEF CON. They're among my favorite conferences. I sometimes feel like the researchers, the good guy researchers are well ahead of the curve. The companies providing the security haven't caught up. You know, the researchers are telling you about issues that security products haven't solved yet and ways to get around security products. And I sometimes think the research community is first. Industry, the InfoSec industry hasn't solved the problem the researchers talk talk about, but I think black hat criminal hackers are relatively lazy and they're not going to waste good work, zero day, a really cool flaw, when a freaking leaked credential gets me in a company. Listen, you said lazy like it's a bad thing. No, no, they're efficient. They're efficient. But but think about it. Colonial pipeline hack, our biggest gas pipeline, 50% of the East Coast. It was breached because a credential that was on a, a, a the dark web and a, a freaking VPN that had no MFA. I mean, it, it's not a sophisticated zero day. It's not. It wasn't even living off the land techniques that bypass certain endpoint controls. It was so 101, and we're not fixing those problems yet. So, yeah. so you definitely have a passion. You want to say something, Jeremy? You, you look, you're biting, buddy. Nope. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be running back to the fridge real soon. So, um, you, you definitely have a passion for security, dude. I, I. Greatly appreciate it. We can probably talk, unfortunately, too long about security. <laughs> um, and, and I look forward to hanging out at DEF CON. i tell you that the, the one I like nowadays, I like uh, the guys from, and they don't know me from Shinola, is the Black Hills uh, security gang from Wild, Wild West Hackenfest. Uh, Where is that? I haven't heard of that one. That's in uh, South Dakota slash, and they just opened up, I'm up in Rio. Um, huh. They're pretty solid dudes. Uh, or dudettes. I think they're mostly dude stuff. And, uh, but, but they're more like the way DEF CON used to be. I mean, gotcha. Used to be Back way- at the Alexis Park days oh when I God, first started what going. What, 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 <laughs> DEF CON 7, baby. Yes, um, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. And that's kind of the way it is, right? Where, where people get together and you're not intimidated by what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you're not engaged. And, 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 and I miss those. I mean, I think DerbyCon became every all the marketers figured out DerbyCon, and, yeah. and so it, it, it really even wasn't... B sides has gotten a little like they they were cool at first, kind of trying to I to hack that, the RSAs, but they've gotten a little. Big I, I think the B sides are good when you're not in Vegas. When you're in Vegas, I think the B sides got crazy when they had the dwarf party back in 2000, right? Gotcha. So so I think that the they're all 
listen, anytime you can get together and talk security, I suppose you live in your basement with your mom. <laughs> right? So, but, but it brings me to an interesting concept because you love security, no doubt about it. I love security. Um, but it always frustrates me because security, there's two things about security. That you're dealing with marketing, which drives security. For sure. But to be secure, you can't listen to marketing, right? I mean, because regardless of how much you say, oh, Cisco, I don't want to get fired for Cisco. Yes, you will. Because that if when the hacker wins, you lose, right? And, and, and the reality is, is that, and that's the reason why I love this industry, because no how much BS you're going to give somebody, say, I didn't say bullshit. No matter how much BS you give somebody, <laughs> that, that, that you're going to lose. Because when you're wrong, not to, they're not going to prove you're wrong. They're going to screw you hard. So yeah. you have this situation. Unfortunately, that's just not the mindset. Marketing has set a wonderful table for people to get screwed in, 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 as far as being a CISO, which you, you are now one of them. Yeah. yeah. So, so in it, you, you've got this trifecta. And I just wanted your insight on that trifecta because I can feel the frustration with Gartner, right? You have yeah. on one side, the marketing group. You have on the other side, reality. And then you have, I hate to say it, to, to the third side of the problem, which is compliance. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually, compliance was the greatest thing for us because at least somebody could justify the marketing budget. But at the same time, it became a checklist by which you bought to with yeah. no vision for what you're trying to accomplish. And, and I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm leading you when I shouldn't be doing this. So so really, what, what I'm fascinated, Corey, because we don't... Most of the time we talk to people, they're, they're on one of those three corners. You don't, you're not in one of those three corners. So how do you survive in the security industry with those three things going on? The guys will screw you, right? The policymakers and the marketeers. How do you live in that triangle? I, so I will tell you, my, my CSO hat is... I just want to be good at doing the basics, blocking and tackling. Like there's a lot of advanced controls I can talk about and neat things that I do that I think are technically awesome. But, you know, was it Vince Lombardi that said basic blocking and tackling wins games? The, the point is we're not doing by we, I'm talking about the universal tech industry. We, we're not doing the basics. We really aren't, right? I, I mean, ransomware which obviously still makes a crap load of money. It's a word I'm so sick of hearing and talking about, but it wouldn't have existed at the beginning. I know there's double extortion now if people had working backups. And I know every time you are on a freaking call and you say, do you have a backup? Uh, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we do backups. Come on, that's not true because every time people were hit with ransomware at the beginning, they were screwed and they paid the ransom. Uh, that's one example. You know, even the simple crap I say, like if you have a VPN, you should have multi-factor authentication. There's so many companies that, Again, same survey question. Do you have multi-factor authentication? They sometimes say yes, but guess what? It turns out two of their IT guys do for their privileged accounts, but they haven't put it around all their employees. What I'm getting at is I, I think half the real world attacks we see, how often is it a Kaseya zero day vulnerability with a deep supply chain, deep attack that got access to the source code servers, installed this super fancy, you know, piece of malware, not even the one that was a Trojan, not even Sunburst, the other one that injected in this. How often is that? Almost never. It's, you know, that's the one we see the news of, but 90% of hacks were a phishing credential that got into a VPN and you get. So to me, I, I want people to start with those basics and to do it. I want to make it easy enough. I think the biggest problem with the security industry, and it's coming out in passwords, for instance, right? Uh, our advice for passwords is probably relatively the same other than the speed of cracking and brute forcing. You know, use a long password make it strong, use it, make it random enough and put, make it different everywhere. Ivory tower, that's good advice. What's the problem with it? No human can follow that. I can't remember a 24 random character password at the hundreds, thousands of sites I lock in every day. It's impossible. So, I, you know, we give all the ivory tower advice, but we don't think of how 
how does a real company actually do this, especially when the real company is actually trying to do the business they're in, which isn't cybersecurity? And, and I think really that's the problem you have to solve. How do you make it simple enough? How do you do the basics? How do you make the basics simple enough? How do you do it at scale? And that is going to beat a lot of the attackers. Now, there's always going to be the sophisticated ones that can get past that, but I, I still believe that's the minority. It's at least going to force the lazy and or efficient ones to, to do more things. But it's a hard question, man. I, I think if someone answered that and could give you a silver bullet, it would exist and it doesn't. I mean, as everyone knows, the defenders have to look out for everything. The attacker just has to find one place you screwed up. All right, Mr. Kraken. Are you going to, go to the crack? Are you going to start rooting for the Kraken now, or are you going to stay with Vegas? All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you like Seattle? Are you a, are you going to be a Kraken guy? <laughs> Is that the Kraken you're so, talking about? Yes, I am. Actually, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. As he laughs and says, so, "I'm still a Knights fan." Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> as a Californian, I'm going to say L.A. Kings first. Right. Okay. <laughs> My son jumped on the uh, Vegas Knights bandwagon when. Uh, they first came out. He was a Flurry fan. He's a Knight. He's a Kings fan, but he was a Flurry fan. So when Flurry went to the to the uh, to the Knights, he became a Knights fan. And, and Vegas is somewhat of a second home, so it's okay. We root for them too. See, I just like the hat. I okay? just thought. <laughs> like, I'm about to jump jump ship, but go ahead. I, I think it's a cool, it's cool. logo. I don't think they're gonna do as well as Vegas did in their first no season. No way. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was a fluke, right? Um, but, you know, who knows? I mean, it's gonna, they're going to shake up the West, so it'll be interesting. The leader of my threat lab so, has so, season so, tickets. So you guys, I was going to say, Rockstar is based out of Seattle, right? Are you still right on the Bay part there? So we're right, by the way, I, the pandemic screwed me. Uh, you'll realize how little of a, I, I don't go to sports lately. I didn't even know C-Link is now Lumen Stadium, but literally WatchGuard yeah. headquarters is in Paul Allen's building. So we kind of, my window looks out to Lumen Stadium. We're, yeah, we're right there. You have a yeah. really classy building. I, I, if it's it like is very like cool. That. It is yeah. cool. All right. I, I, by the way, I've been long enough. We used to be on Pioneer Square, which was only a few blocks away, but the new building's definitely cooler. <laughs> so, so Jeremy, you actually have a question because I just threw you down a hockey bill. It's probably what left your brain now. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it was intelligent and informative <laughs> for our audience, but now I lost it, so it's irrelevant. <laughs> so, so I have a question then. There, there's a lot of uh, competition in this very uh, old market, this mature market for SIM tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A SIM tool to have to be competitive. Corey, we're a SIM tool, just to let you know. So, gotcha. Uh, where do you see a SIM tool to have to be competitive in 2022 to really make a difference for clients? As much as you can automate, man. I, I mean, uh, we're kind of we're never going to be a SIM tool that takes controls from everyone because we're our vendor ourselves. But really, our cloud management is becoming very SIM-ish in its ability to correlate and automate alerts. I, I mean, I know you. <laughs> Uh, I want to see you take stuff from all three of those pillars. I want to see a lot more identity-based stuff, behavioral analytics. I want to see the, the real correlation happen. You know, I strongly feel that when you start to really... I, I, I hate to use buzzwords. We know AI and ML are buzzwords, but they're also helpful. And the more data we get, the better they do get at, at the very least getting rid of a, a you know, alert uh, delusion. So, you know, one, make it easier to ingest all this stuff from cloud, from network endpoints and identity. Uh, I do, I'm in a market for a SIM tool, and I'm looking for things that really do that correlation. Uh, I want something that shows me mostly alerts that really, you know, don't show me it when it's at the noise state. Help me prioritize the stuff that really matters. Help me, you know, do all the basic enriching of threat intelligence, but that I, I don't care as much about. Uh, to you guys can tell me the difference between SOAR and SIM. I, I just I think SOAR is probably just SIM 2.0, but I do like the playbooks. I'm looking for automation. You know, okay, even okay. sorry, go ahead. No, no, no you hit the, the hit the the SOAR is really playbook. Uh, yeah. the SIM is is a little bit different in the sense of, of, of 
there's so many parts to collecting it. But, but I, I, I want that though. I mean, right. The, the whole sim, the point of the sim is to aggregate all that data to help show me incidents and events. But if I'm an SMB, I don't just want to know about it. I want to automate it because I don't have the IR guy that can sit there and really. So this is going to cost you a couple, a couple cracking tickets. I'm thinking. Oh no. Sweep. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting sweep. Yeah. So it's going to take us a sweep, Corey. We're, we'll sit down and we'll explain to you the differences because I think a lot of what you're thinking about from cor correlation point of view really is not the source responsibility. That can all be yeah. done uh, properly in a sim. Uh, the source is really a playbook is, is when, the, the, it's broken between communicating, right? So if you're a stovepipe organization, you might not need a sort. If you have watch guard from end to end, yeah, yeah. right? Do you really need a sort? No. If you, but but do, you, do you really need a sim? Because if we're trying to grab all these portfolio companies and create our cloud and maybe do some of that correlation ourselves. But, but my point is I, I get what you're saying. But what, where's the perfect place to make a decision of what playbook to run based on an incident? Why not the place that's gathering all the alerts you need and correlating the information and telling oh, you the incident exists? Exactly if, right. I, if I know an incident exists, I'm going to want to do about something about it. And I know enterprises and smart people that, you know, maybe some humans aren't ready to push the automate button yet because they're worried about false positives. But guess what? The first people that will do that are SMBs because they don't have educated enough people to make the decision so the sooner that the place where i get all the alerting and the correlation to rise up that incident that i know is a true thing that's where i want the playbook to run that solves it for me and talks to all my controls to turn we're things gonna, off we're gonna have a season two for us and, and it's gonna be our <laughs> alcohol version that you were talking about before it's because it's gonna be called bourbon beers and bites um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way maybe my opinion is I, I enterprises separate all this crap. Enterprises yeah. separate all these layers. SMB wants to consolidate it. it. You know, I know you say it's commoditized, but what the heck is this this thing? Well, this is a calculator, a video player, a computer. I have a TV, I have a calculator, but I use this because it does what I need. SMBs want to consolidate all this crap because they don't have the time and the money to, to yeah, do all these yeah. separate things. So, so if you take a step back and you said, what's the difference between a sort of sim? And this is really, we were, we were talking to you, not us. Um, yeah. is, is that the, really the sim is when you're talking across knowledge planes. So yeah. when Meraki has to talk to, du uh, not Duo, because they're the same plane, but well, Cisco has no integration. But but I get what you're saying. When a network control talks to an endpoint, to a well, AP, to a, net, a switch, to a router, I know what a sim is, well, dude. Well, but, but, but in, in the, the key here is, is that, and this is the reason why we believe in UEBA, the, the yeah. behavioralist, is that the key is, is that you have an endpoint, you have a person, not forget all the electronics. You have a person. The yeah. one thing that we never really talk about, and and that person Zero is yeah. talking all the way to the cloud, and you have to yeah. you have to pull that stuff together and say, I need a response that goes across the network, across this device, and across the cloud at the same time. That's where a playbook comes into play. But if you just wanted to say, oh, I wanted to go to Total Vi Virus Total, look up the shot two fifty six, and then I want to go to who is and look up the domain to see if it was updated in the last forty eight hours, but the sim does that. Every sim does that, okay? And so, it, and you know what? It, the sim shouldn't even do it because every product already does that. Yeah. That, that if you look at WatchGuard and you realize all the automation that's already done, ask yourself, well, what's missing? Here's the answer, nothing. It's actually already done. What's missing is when they cross their boundaries. And so, and, and that's where, that's a reason why I was digging into, and, and I'm going to go back to you now is this the future of watch guard, right? So integration is huge and automation is huge, but, it, but it's sim is only gets pulled in when you have diversity of products where I decide to run Sentinel one over here, CrowdStrike over there and McAfee and, and, and let's throw in a little Cisco, right? But if you're an SMB, it makes perfectly great sense, not good sense, great sense to go ahead and just be watch far across the board with an integrated console, right? And you're going to win that battle, in my opinion. And it's certainly the battle we're playing. Yeah. 
Well, we are bringing notice one of the acquisitions was MFA. Uh, we do care yeah. about identity. We do things like impossible login geos. I, I see, granted, people like me that use private VPNs all the time can screw with this, but I, I can't log in from Seattle one minute ago and then Russia five minutes later. Hey, so yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that, that. That's why I said I screw it up with my private VPN use. Yeah. So, but, but so where is WatchGuard going? I mean, is, 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 so you got this latest piece, right? And you don't have to, yes, you do have to tell us where are you going no, with the acquisition strategy? I mean, are you saying to yourself, we've got to get a cloud com company? Are you looking at like Black Onyx with Glenn Chisholm? Are you looking at, is, is there- I, I, I'm not going to share the acquisitions I'm going, but I will say SASE okay. is what we're focused you, on. So SASE has, has zero trust. And by the way, I know zero- Zero trust is just a stupid marketing term for something we've always talked about, which is least Buzz privileged word. principle. It, it, yes, <laughs> but, but least privileged okay. principle, right? And it's the idea that a person, what you said, it's a person on the computer. And we should, as a community, that person should only be doing the stuff that's necessary for their job not everything at your company. Like if I have VPN into a network, I can probably, and I'm an accountant, I, I get on this flat network where I can actually from IP level access the source code con server, right? The, mm. or, or maybe I can access our, our local GitHub. Uh, zero trust allows me when I start to add identity to the equation, I can start to put better policy about even letting my internal employees only do things they allow. And then I do too believe in Yuba. So I personally think SASE includes some of the cloud concepts you're talking about. Are we acquiring a cloud company? I, I can't say. Are we pursuing SASE, which means making sure that all of our security, we have this single policy that works whether or not people have stuff in public and private cloud, SaaS clouds, and that it's all based on identity and zero trust at its core? That's so, what we care so about. You bring up a really pivotal point here. Do you think yeah. that modern security is limited to acronyms you can pronounce? I mean, no, it's it's an easy, you know, it's we, a I shortcut. Get to the point of being able to actually say the different letters back to back and therefore have an actual concept, or does it actually, does Gartner actually have an entire team that works on pronounceable acronyms? Are they even pronounceable? Yeah. I, I is Casby's point pronounceable? I hate oh, the yeah. Casby acronym well, more Casby, than anything. You know, Casby, you have sore, right? Yeah, Casby's sore. You can pronounce sore is a word. Right. Sassy is weird, by the way, because until I heard them pronounce it, I just thought it was sass. <laughs> mm. uh, which, by the way, is the yeah. same as another word, S-A-A-S, as opposed to S-A-S-E. So I, I don't know if you, I, I personally don't think they're very pronounceable. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I guess that <laughs> I was my theory. <laughs> XDR? How do you pronounce XDR? Stir? See, there you go. That's actually the uh, first one. That's the reason why it won't work. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> or ZTNA. So, Z -Z 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 <laughs> See, these are all things that nobody ever talks about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, Jeremy, you have a So, Corey, you've spent um, 20 plus years, 22 years with WatchGuard. You were a public company who was acquired by PE. Oh, Explain wow. the difference in your in, in the in the way the company has grown because of one or the other. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I, I, by the way, I was with the company when we went public too, which was an exciting time until the bubble burst. Uh, if you know the timing of that, it was literally right before the bubble burst. Uh, you know, employees had 13 cent shares. We launched at $13. And I know mine went up to 125 and they, I think they were 150 high. So it was exciting. Uh, but uh, obviously the bubble burst and that disappeared. Uh, I will say, you know, I forget stock and all that. To me, you are a successful company by making a product that does something that customers really need and have a use for and care about. And if you do that right, the rest will come. Uh, the difference is when we were public, suddenly you have Sarbox. Suddenly you have shareholders and shareholder meetings. And, and suddenly you, you, know, you guys talk about marketing, but when you have shareholders, you have to get up in front of a 
people with the public report all the time and tell them what you're doing and, and why and spin a story that changes their expectation. Right. I think uh, you guys may like, like the stock market more, but to me, it's just gambling and prices are not valued at what they're worth or what how profitable they are. They're valued at what general people think of them. So you can actually have a company do very well if they spin a good story in, in these public markets. Granted, they do at least have to release public financials. So the real people that that you can go by that, too. But you'll notice a lot of the biggest companies are not always profitable. So the biggest change with the P.E. Yeah. is the P.E. ultimately makes money by making your company profitable. They care about things like EBITDA, which, by the way, is a measure of how much profit you're making, essentially. They care about revenue growth. And the way you get those things aren't trying to change people's expectations with words. It's about actually selling the product because people need it and want it and like it. So I think the one thing the PE gave us is the ability to, one, drop things like Starbucks, which, by the way, takes a lot of money, time, and accountants to take care of. So you can be a little more nimble you don't have to worry about that public uh, accounting process. And we have good PE owners. While they definitely want you to be a profitable company and they drive that, you know, ours has allowed us to buy five companies in, or, or four companies in five years. So you know, a PE won't have the, the profile of a venture capitalist inve uh, investor. A venture capitalist will, they'll take 10 risks and pay big money and only two of them pan out and the rest fail spectacularly, but they're looking for the one that's the unicorn that fails at that, that is 50X. A P company won't take, at maybe, I'm generalizing, but a P company is looking for companies that work as a business. Uh, if they tell can tell a management team is business focused, they will invest, they will give you money to grow, uh, but they, they want you to prove that this isn't just unicorns in, in, I don't know, magic, and that it actually is a product that has a market and that people want and that can continue to make money. I hope that answered the question. No, it's, that's a great answer. I think yeah. that for our listeners who um, have companies that may be public or, or are considered going public and or considering PE acquisition, I think it's something that's a, it's a good opinion. It's a good experience yeah. to hear about. So well, obviously, I mean, the, on the pro side with the stock is you do get a big, you know, if you get good investors, you suddenly have a big amount of money. Uh, so, but, but how you use that money, I've seen companies blow it for bad things. But anyways, keep going. Sorry about that. <clears throat> no worries. Um, whips. Wireless Why intrusion so prevention. Special? Why is really? that so special versus what everybody else has? Uh, really, it came down to a partnership we made with a company that was previously called Mojo and is now Arista. So uh, they had a patent, and that's why ours is so powerful. So let me give you, there's all kinds of different whips for the audience. I'm sure they know is wireless intrusion perfect protection. Nothing to do with IPS. This is layer two wireless stuff you're protecting against. Let's, for example, say someone throws up an evil twin. WatchGuard has an SSID called WatchGuard. Someone throws up an evil twin. It's very easy for me to put up an SSID called WatchGuard. And then it becomes a, a radio strength game. Whoever's closest, whoever has antennas, my clients are going to connect to the closest and strongest one. Uh, this is, by the way, if it's an open uh, network. But with WAP protected, there's ways to do this too. Uh, but anyways... Evil twins, it's easy for my clients to suddenly be told to go somewhere else. Every company in the world has, every wireless company in the world has a way to detect when their clients are going to a, a access point, an evil twin, that's not theirs because we know the MAC addresses, we see them on the wire and on the wired network. But the, and every company in the world knows a good way to try to get that client back to me. One way is to do a wireless attack kind of de-authing them off that other network to try to pull them back to you. The problem is everyone, like, for instance, I think Cisco had one called something sheriff, air sheriff that did this. But if you read the fine print of their manual, they said, by the way, you probably shouldn't turn this on 
because if we do it wrong or have a false positive, it's a 25K FCC violation. If we suddenly send a ton of deauth packets to a client that really was supposed to go to Starbucks. And the problem is the some of the some of the the ways that they're doing it are not strong enough. They're they're prone to false positives. Mojo or Arista has a patent that we use with our own M part partnership called marker packets. So our APs have a special, it's basically part of every wireless and wired. We send mic marker packets internally, the AP connected to all the switches. So it goes to all our switches and internal devices. And we send that marker packet out in all our wires traffic. Long story short, we know 100% if a client's ours because they have that marker packet. And so that when we're de-authing someone from someone else's evil twin, we're not accidentally de-authing the wrong person or the wrong, I mean, you know, I'm, it's not really a person, it's a MAC address of a device or whatever, uh, but we're de-authing something we know belongs on our network because of that marker packet. So it's that, it's ultimately that patent that allows us to say, not only do we have this capability, but you can turn it on without worrying that it will make mistakes that will get you some sort of FCC fine. Gentlemen, we are at our five minute mark. I know that usually means Jeremy has about 10 more questions. So, <laughs> <laughs> so APT Jeremy, blocker, are we gonna what does that mean? What does that function <laughs> actually do? Jeremy, we're okay. supposed to get free product now at this point. Free, free product. I don't know. APT blocker is is a marketing name, by the way, <laughs> very much. Yeah, so, figured. so that's a but it's actually a, it's really about stronger malware conduct, uh, detection. But essentially, have you heard of last line? So we we have three types of net like our endpoint protection is totally different, totally our own IP. But on network, we have three types of malware detection: uh, GAV which is essentially bit defender and is mostly signature based AV. As we all know, that's effective at catching noise, but it misses a lot. We have something called IAV, intelligent AV. That's a deal with Silence, who I guess is now Blackberry. Blackberry. Uh, yeah, and as you know, Silence uses machine learning they to, just to more- got a new McAfee person over there too. Yeah, yeah. So that, that uses that. But APT Blocker is a partnership with Lastline, who was a FireEye competitor. Lastline, a bunch of uh, professors from, I think it was Santa Barbara. They used to have, they used to have a JavaScript intercept program. Uh, exactly. They made, that was called Anubis. Yeah. They, uh, Anubis. Yep. So they, they made one of the first behavioral sandboxes and then they productized one. So it's your, your typical, this, by the way, doesn't do, it does what they call a full system uh, uh, code emulation. So they're not literally running it in a hypervisor, but they pop up a fake virtual machine. Uh, that's that's you how know. a lot of actual AVs actually work. AVs, it, it, the attack when Chris Kaversky was alive, we used to talk about this all the time. The attack yeah, yeah, yeah. Really against the sounds like you might even know Giovanni and Christopher Krugel. They're they're cool guys, PhD candidates. You know that's my hacker name. Yeah. <laughs> sure. but, but yeah, it is essentially a sandbox. So it's very good at detecting malware that has never had a signature written. In fact, they've done tests. We all know about VirusTotal. Uh, they do tests where they submit a new sample they've seen to VirusTotal that it doesn't have. AV engines get maybe two hits on it, and they were already detecting it. Uh, but behavioral model, you run it in a machine that's faking to be a Windows machine has things like like Adobe. But one of their key things is, as you might know, even in sandboxing, bad guys have started doing ev evasions, uh, things like trying to slow down the execution of malware with different things. They, because they actually are doing full system emulation, they're e able to see the actual physical processor in memory. So they actually pay attention to things like evasions. Like if malware is looking for mouse movement to make sure it's not in a so, sandbox. So the best one I yeah. was a, the, there was a piece of malware that compares the two times. Yeah. And that in a GDB, you would have done interrupts. And it yeah. realizes that the, the number of cycles is different than the number of interrupts. And therefore, it does. Yeah, it's time. timing speed of CPU. Yeah. But what they do is they see it looking for something and they Jedi mind trick it back. Yeah. They yeah. say, hey, here, here's what you're looking for. Keep going. Trust me, we, we spent a yeah. lot of time reverse engineering Microsoft Word because... Yeah. This is that we would do. We just go ahead and point to a real program. Yeah. Like, what the hell? 
but anyways, so, so yeah. So really it comes down to an APT blocker is an OEM license with last line. Okay. That's yeah. interesting. So, so last line did, did, did successfully- They were acquired by the way, by VMware. So last line, just so you know, it's okay. now VMware. That's good. Yeah. To know. yeah. I didn't know that whatever happened to them. Okay. Oh, there, they, they did quite well. Why, <laughs> yeah. Which is one of the reasons why VMware is like the leader in the magic quadrant for a sassy or yeah. whatever. Right. Because yeah. of some of those tools. Well, All right. gentlemen, we are, we are just about at time here. Any final question, uh, Chris? Yeah, you know what? So the crack and tickets, they're good, right? Jeremy and I, we get to go up. That's really what it comes down to. You want the free crack and tickets? Where are you guys located? I have no clue, by the way. So we're around DC, but he's on the West Coast, but oh, cool. free tickets are free tickets. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, I'll take you to a Kings folks. game if you take me to a Kraken game. Sounds like a trade. Sounds like oh, a good one. But we need an arm yeah. because I, I can't trust Seattle right now. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> yeah, all the bad press you guys have. It's You guys are like the next Portland. There's Portland and then there's Seattle. <laughs> are you talking about activism <laughs> or something? There's, there's Seattle's pre- uh, a lot of uh, homeless people but i don't see much going on downtown okay, seattle we're these safe. days we're safe. the needle's not going to follow that on i i don't think the needle's doing to fall on you okay okay then we'll take the tickets we appreciate it we'll take the tickets right jeremy yeah hey what if, if you want to sponsor it we're all good for that <laughs> so one 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 last question what does Corey do when he's not being a nerd at watch guard what is Corey? at watch guy i'm probably being a nerd i mean I play with my dogs and family, but to be honest, my hobbies are so cliche. I, I'm into VR. Uh, I'm sweating in Beat Saber playing Half-Life Alex. I have a PlayStation. <laughs> I, I paddleboard with my dog. Beat Saber. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. Hey, it's a fun-ass yeah, game. It's a fun a, game. I get sick as a dog in VR. I really do. I can't stay in VR too long. Uh, no, I, I've been in it for six hours at a time. I definitely have my VR legs. <sighs> It's the future. Uh, the, closest, the closest I get is watching people put VR on for the first time and scream because there's monsters coming after them. <laughs> By the way, I, I, I do this with curtains pulled in private because no matter what you do in VR, you look like a moron. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's going to be the quote for this hey, show. Well, Thank you. you exactly. So listen, Corey, thoroughly enjoyed the time this evening. Uh, Chris and Jeremy, as always, appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to uh, the audience. I think they're going to learn a lot this evening by listening oh, yeah. to this uh, podcast and really uh, encourage them to reach out to you and talk to you more about what you guys do. Happy. And it's fun hanging out with you guys. At any time I can do a podcast with a beer or any alcohol, I'm a happy guy. Well, it's hard alcohol next time. We, we all- I, I, I'll pull out the scotch for our next conversation. Ooh, too much peat. <laughs>